Drew Thomas Hendricks here. I'm the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. On this show, I talk with leaders in the wine and craft oh, yeah. beverage industry. Before I get on with the show, brief sponsor message. Today's episode sponsored by Barrels Ahead. Barrels. At Barrels Ahead, we help the wine and craft industry build stronger bonds through with our customers and brands through authentic content. Go to BarrelsAhead.com today to learn more. Today, I'm talking with Arnaud Fabre. Arnaud is the founder and general manager of Beanum Wines in Paso Robles. How's it going, Arnaud? Good, and you? Doing well. We have we actually know each other. We've worked on a couple sites together, and um, really excited to have you on the show. Bianca is yeah. also joining us today. Hi, guys. Bianca. So, hey, Arnaud, Arnaud, talk to us about Beanum. So there's so much to say about Binum, uh, but basically uh, Binum it's uh, it's a brand I started with my brother Guillaume from uh, Close Lane uh, back in uh, 2015. Uh, as you can hear, you know we have um, we are French, mm -hmm. another French family in Paris Robles. So uh, everybody is saying that we are taking over, but that's not true. There's a there is a pretty large French connection there. <laughs> Why? No, we um, we are from the Languedoc uh, region, uh, so southern of France. Uh, that's where our family got established. Um, you know, my brother Guillaume, who is a winemaker uh, for Binum and owner, obviously, uh, he's a six generations of winemaker in my family. Uh, so wine is flowing in our blood, you know. Yeah. And so when I was about uh, six to eight years old. Um, my dad wanted um, something different, you know, than the longer dot. He wanted to deal with more cab, Merlot, you know, Cabernet Franc and Malbec. And so we bought a property on the um, on the right bank of Bordeaux in the Côte de Beau, mm. in the uh, in the late nineties, early two thousand. And so that's pretty much where I was raised, Bordeaux, and that's where I fell in love in wine. And so uh, my brother, who uh, did the first vintage in 2004, um, wanted to kind of learn English to kind of develop the sales and marketing of, of the Chateau in Bordeaux. He uh, got in contact with a, a friend um, of my parents who knew Stefan and Beatrice at Aventure in Paso Robles. Oh, okay. okay. So that's kind of how we landed. In Basel in 2004, and uh, that's where the whole story started. Where uh, he fell in love with the region, I uh, decided to move full time uh, in Paso. So he was. You didn't just to... fall in love with the region, though. What's that? You didn't just fall in love with the region. It's coming. It's coming. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. That's Cut you off. It's, it's such a fairy tale story. <laughs> yeah, and so. Um, in uh, in uh, you know for, so he moved to uh, to Paso to be a blast on winemaker of Stefan Laventure, and uh, that's where the whole thing uh, kind of continued. In 2008, he started Close Soleil with 50 cases of white on the back of Laventure, uh, and uh, and that's how the whole brand started uh, at Laventure. In the same year, uh, he got married back in Bordeaux. And he obviously invited Stefan and Beatrice, the owner of L'Aventure, along with the kids. And that's kind of how I met Chloe. Uh, not with a dance uh, on this wedding, it's more like trying to approach her, but I was very shy at that point. So uh, it's more like in 2009 when I came to Basso as an intern that we start kind of dating. Uh, I started in Basso uh, at just winery for about two years. As an intern on a production, I did as well some um, some uh, testing room, uh, which was good for me because that's how I learned English a lot. Mm -hmm. And then in 2011, Chloe and I went back to France. She spent some time in Paris on the fashion industry. And I was in Bordeaux finishing up my studies on a business, wine business in spirit. And uh, in the same time, I was uh, helping my parents on the vineyard, but as well selling the property. Uh, and so we saw the property in 2012, uh, a year later. And then uh, in 2013, Chloe and I kind of decided what's our next plan. And mm -hmm. so she really wanted to go back to America because much more opportunities. I loved Paso Robles as well. So I told her, you know what, 
let's do it. So we moved in 13. Uh, I start, uh, started the work at law in the early 19, uh, 2014. And she obviously slowly uh, took over La Venture uh, Winery. She started in the tissue room and she went, I worked all, all the way up to now managing the whole place. Um, and so I worked at law from 2014 to 2019. So I stayed five years. They taught me a lot of things. You know, I went on every corner of the winery in sales and marketing to learn as much as I could. Um, and that's all the way up to 2015 that Guillaume and I wanted to start our own brand, you know, because we want to continue the family legacy as we stopped everything in France. That's what Binom came all about. That's amazing. And, and for the people who are listening, how did Binom get its name? So Binom, uh, it took, it took uh, we didn't find the name at the beginning. Uh, you know, we started making our, our few barrels in 2015. It was worth about 200 cases. Same thing for 16. So at that time I was, you know, working at law in helping Guillaume as much as I could uh, during harvest and making the wine. Uh, and so we, we found the name in the 2000, end of 2016 where we needed to label the wines. Uh, and so Binom means a project together in French. Uh, you actually spell it differently. You spell it B-I-N-O-M-E in French. But we wanted everyone to say the same way. So that's why we kind of tweak the world a little bit. Yeah, that would. I, it, yeah, you're, you're allowed to take creative license, and it's easier to copyright something like that when you make up the. Yeah. There's only one, one B non spelled like this. Is there? <laughs> so, on talk to me about the on marketing. So you 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 got your degree in France for um, wine business and marketing, and yeah. then and then made the jump over to the U.S. How how what. What are the differences between the two? Like when you had to come to the U.S., it's a, it's a much different way of marketing wine here, I believe. Very, very much so. Um, I think the main distribution, I'm going to talk more into the wine, uh, you know, industry. You know, in France, you know, the property that we used to have were small and, you know, the, we were retailing our wines at around like 10 to 20 bucks a bottle. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much more competition in France. Uh, just to give you an idea, there is about 8,000 producer, 8,000 producer in Bordeaux. Only. Just in Bordeaux. <laughs> wow. Well, to 500 in Paso. And so um, it's um, uh, with that competition and the way everything is being marketed in France, it's more, uh, I would say, 90% of the, the, the sales are happening through distribution, you know, supermarket, retailers, restaurants, and all of that. So you always need to be on the market and invest on people to be out and sell your wine and with the risk, obviously, of losing the brand. Because when you go on distribution, mm -hmm. you know, you enter into the book and you are part of many, many brands and all the sales rep has to remember, you know, all the details about yeah. each winery. You can't really do that. It's almost their version of the three-tier system where you have a, you're, you're going out and you're marketing it. Yeah. I mean, the three-tier is very specialized to us. Yeah. Uh, is, which I understand, you know, it's a, it's a great uh, way of, you know, having a representation on each state, but for each producer, it's really hard compliance wise, but as well distribution wise to find the perfect distributor, perfect retailer on each state you want to be in. But so to compare with U.S., in U.S., for a small winery like us, you know, in U.S., you have tasting rooms and you have wine clubs. And, and that's what makes a huge difference to France is the unitourism here is much more involved than it is in France. Oh. But we say at Binom, you know, we do 98, 99% of our sales through direct-to-consumer. Mm -hmm. When people come to taste at the winery, have a flight of wine, sit down and enjoy the wines. And if they're fell in love with the wine, the quality and the story, they join the club. Mm -hmm. And so they have that subscription that comes every six months or every year back to their door and they can come back, taste the new vintage with the parties and the dinners and all that. So you don't have as much as interaction uh, in France as you have here on the direct-to-consumer side. That's why is 
difficult in France, and they are kind of transition transitioning to that. Uh, but it's harder. It's it's hard to to do, to do a big shift. You know, it's hard. Yeah, it's the um. We, and we were going to talk more about Paso, but I'm fascinated about France. Is it's evolving, and the younger consumers are coming into the board. Is it starting to be more direct consumers? Like, are the um, wineries looking for more of this kind of tasting experience? Or, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of the style of wine as well. Change with the the young generation traveling more, experiencing the new world, the type of blend, the creativity, the freedom of blending whatever we want. It's kind of the same thing that we see on the sales and marketing side, where when you have those French people coming here, especially you know. As at Binom, Clouson, and Laventure, we have always French interns uh, because of our connections. Sure. And so we are amazed by that the tasting room, the way we do things, the sit down tastings, and really the care of the hospitality side. Uh, and so I would say those young people are, are very intrigued by that and want to apply it you know, mm-hmm. to the, the French, French market. But it's hard because you don't have. Uh, you know, it's on your culture to do wine tasting, you know, uh, regularly or like spend the whole weekend in Paso. And so in France, you don't, va- you don't have as much of mm-hmm. that. So yeah. how is the wine tasting done in France versus the U.S.? But, you know, you, when you go to a property, you hope for uh, the, the taste room to be open. Most of the time you catch the producer, the farmer, on the vineyard and like, hey, we'd like to taste your wine and you stop the tractor and jump and open the bottles. And he can go, you know, for three, four hour tasting or even he takes you on the lunch. He can go on a crazy side, uh, but you don't have like a tea. I mean, I'm talking about generally speaking. There's obviously some wineries, especially in, uh, in more in Rhone, that have the setup to receive people every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I would say this kind of setup I don't know, it would be 10, 20% of the setup in France, but more importantly, it's those young, produ- small producer. It's the, the farmer is doing the vineyard, the winemaking and tasting rooms, and he's doing everything. So it's, it's very, very, very different. But also you have those, you know, appellations where they schedule yearly basis, uh, where they call, uh, where the winery open their door for the weekend and, People can come and taste, uh, but it's more like a bar and you taste a few wines, you buy a few bottles and you leave. You don't spend the whole hour talking about the story, the vineyard, the climate, the terroir, and all of that as much as you do here. Sure. Wow. Interesting. Talking about hospitality, that shift into where you are now in Paso and you get, you I, from working with you for the last year, you pay, pay so much attention to the experience. Talk to me about the experience and why it's so important for wineries, especially at your level of caliber. Yeah, I mean, you know, hospitality kind of, it's in our blood because my my grandmother and grandfather um, used to have a hotel and restaurant and, and I worked on them, you know, for a few seasons when I was in vacation during the summer. So I was I always... I've been into the hospitality side, but I was amazed when I arrived here, especially working for law, which, uh, you know, if you guys have not been, it's a very state-of-the-art winery, uh, very modern, really focusing on premium wines, experience, and all of that. And I was amazed by that. And so that's what I I really pushed to work over there Mm -hmm. uh, to the point uh, I was talking to the general manager every week. I'm like, Give me the phone number of the owner. I'd like to talk to them and, and all of that because I really wanted to work there. And so I got the job and and really the the the, the fact that for me now, everybody's making good wine or great wine. Uh, what really changed, obviously, is the taste of each of the people coming in. But what really makes the difference is the connection, you know, the relationship. And so our goal is to create that relationship with customers and really, you know, tell them about, you know, how we do things, um, how we make the wine, how we like to farm the vineyard. Um, and the way that we treat the customer really, really well, we spend an hour and a half with them. They have a flight of five to six wines. 
and we we sit down with them and we explain everything. So we can go on a very educational tasting where people want as much production information as they want. Or we can bombard on the live, you know, conversation if we feel like people are just want to talk about their life and know more about our story and all of that. And after the one kind of, you know, sell by itself, you know, it's, we really talk a little bit about the wines, how we, we like to do things. But after, you know, the tasting part, it's on their end, you know, we don't have tasting notes. We, we just have a presentation of the wine, the title and the blend, and that's it. You know, we, we want to be, to have them kind of judge the wine and not influence them by anything. So like, you know, tasting notes or, pricing and all of that. So, so it's more like relationship for us. Sure. And there's like a, what I've seen working with you is there's almost this, there's a synergy. A lot, I see a lot of wineries making a mistake where they, they may have a very high end, fantastic wine, but then you go into the tasting room and the people behind the bar that are pouring don't have that same level of knowledge. And then there's a disconnect. And the one thing that I really loved about being able to work with you is I see all the Google reviews and the, Review after review after review just talks about what the how that one on one experience is and how knowledgeable it is. Yeah, I mean, you have to know about wine. You, I mean, obviously, when we hire, it's not our priority to find somebody that knows everything about wine. It's more like we want to find somebody that is passionate to learn and discover more so that having a W set or master or blah, blah, blah. It's, it's that, that thing is great to have. Obviously, it's a plus. But what we want to find is passionate people. And then, you know, just by working here every day, they learn everything. You know, they learn. We have the cellar right behind the tasting room. So they see when my brother and his team uh, works in the cellar. We, we try every month to do tastings of French wines or Spanish wines or other wines to, comp- to, to compare what is, for example, Syrine. In Rhone versus Paso, Bordeaux uh, versus Napa or Paso, it's always important for us to to give them new details, a new education point, in order for them to communicate it back to the customer. And so we want them to be aware on the whole process of winemaking, but as well the knowledge of wine in a world. So it takes time, you know. It takes a lot of time to train somebody. Uh, and have it really feel part of the brand and have the brand in the blood, you know. Like I know, it took me about six six months to really feel it, mm. to really feel the brand and be comfortable mm-hmm. on the t- tasting and and give that knowledge back to a customer. Yeah, I think that's so that's so important. Like you mentioned, the W set and all the knowledge, but all the knowledge in the of wine in the world isn't going to really help the person when they're there talking with the customer or talking with the person about the wine right there. Cause you really don't want someone just spitting off everything they know about wine. Cause you're not really reacting to the, to the person exactly. in front of you. Well, in yeah. my experience working in the tasting rooms too, the people with the W sets, I mean, they were always, they always kind of seemed like they should be in the restaurant world. There wasn't this huge fit for them in the tasting room. Um, that, actually the ones that didn't come in knowing so much and that were teachable and trainable performed better. Yeah. And it's fashion, you know, Yeah, when you have you need to learn, uh, that's what matters to us. You know, uh, you know, we had uh, some, uh, when I was at law, you know, I remember um, uh, a girl that was working in Capoli that started in uh, design and, and she worked all the way up to, to marketing manager and she was passionate about it. She was into wine. She wanted to discover and, and more importantly as well, she wanted to work and develop and all of that. So uh, that's why, you know, on our team, we have those people because it helped us being um, inspired, you know, and continue to find new ideas and all of that. Because, you know, when you are owner and manager or even an employee, you want to be inspired and uh, when you want, you are inspired, you can do a lot of things. Yeah, for sure. I want to I want to shift for a second because you're in a pretty unique location where your tasting room is in a place yeah. called Tin City in Paso Robles, and you're one of the 
talk to us about it for a lot of people that may not have visited there and some of the advantages of being in sort of that, I don't want to call it a collective, but in some sort of a, um, a space yeah. devoted to food and wine. Yeah, no. So it's a, uh, so Paso, it's kind of divided into side real down by the 101 where you have the east side and the west side. Uh, Chin City, it's on the south uh, of uh, Paso downtown on the on the east side of the 101. Uh, it's kind of a district where you have about 25 wineries, you have a, a brewery, you have a cider place, you have restaurants. So you can pretty much park your car uh, there and spend the whole day wine tasting, drinking beer. I mean, obviously, if you, if you do all of them, uh, I'm sorry for you. It's going to be a tough <laughs> Um but uh, it, it's cool because it's all new winemakers, young people, again, passionate about their work. And they, 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 uh, the vibe there, it's very, it's, it's a great vibe, you know. And so you can see everybody's making wine. They have their door open during harvest. You have trucks, a load of fruit coming in, uh, dumping on each wine. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great vibe to go. And so, when you do wine tasting, you can pretty much yeah go from a tasting room to another and really uh, experience the feeling of 25 to 30 winemakers with a different style, different blends, and all of that. So you have a pretty good pulse of Paso by just going to Teen City. And so all those guys are sourcing fruit from West Side, East Side Paso, even Santa Maria, Santa Barbara. So you have a, a good diversity, which is awesome. Yeah, it's expanded a lot, I believe. Um, I, hard to believe. So 45 wineries now? No, I would say there's about 20, 20 to 30 wineries. About 20 to 30. And as it's grown, has it kept that same collaborative kind of um, co- like a, a work environment? I mean, is everybody friendly or is it is, it, is competition it's, coming in? No, you know, in, in Paso, you won't feel any competition at all on any type of wineries. Even Chin City, the winery is around, you know. That's the first thing people tell us uh, when they visit Paso for the first time. They are in love with that community. We want to help each other grow. And so a lot of recommend from, you know, taste from people or owners to us, and we do the same thing back to them. And so it's a really strong community uh, that works great um, as a whole to promote Paso on another level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is, um, where would you like to see Paso grow? So as, as it expands and as it, as it is such a great region and so, such a collaborative area, as it expands, how would you like to see its growth occur? I mean, we we pretty much want to have the same thing. You know, we, uh, we don't want obviously to be known uh, as very commercial and all of that because we are getting more traffic so that's why we try to keep, you know, that kind of family side. Mm-hmm. I'm talking more, more importantly to dinner, where we could open our doors to more people, hire more people, make more wine, and do do uh, do more traffic. But we want to keep it small. Mm-hmm. We want to be family oriented, uh, you know, and uh, we want to make sure quality is consistently growing. Obviously, we are making more and more wine, but. It's very organic. You know, we want to stay small. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, all the people around us are uh, definitely growing, but we are not um, changing our growth a lot more because of the traffic. If, if you understand what I mean, it's, mm-hmm. like it's not because of more and more people that we're going to make a time or one. And so I think people are, are more into that mindset of continue to grow together, being very strong from each other. And uh, promote Paso as much as we can, as we can, and give a great experience. You know. Yeah, I sure wasn't, hope it's. Oh. oh no! I was just going to say, wasn't there a, a documentary on Amazon about? Yeah, that's a that's a documentary from uh, I would say 2015 or 16 when it was filmed. Uh, so you see, uh, Chris Olen actually, uh, my brother. Uh, on it uh, when he started. He started in Chin City uh, in 2013 or 14 uh, with his four wineries and, and the brewery. 
And um, that documentary is around that time. But since then, it's changed quite a bit. Quite a bit. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, maybe. That's, that's kind of the beauty of, of Teen City. Uh, again, is, you know, we're able to have our, you know, test room, winery, bar room, in about five to 6,000 square feet. So it's really uh, great for us financially to grow without impacting too much. And our next plan down the road is definitely to have a vineyard and, you know, be involved on the west side where we source our fruit, have a winery, and taste So that's what we see every day when we push our door. And what motivates us is the fact that we see ourselves more on the west side on the road. And then we'll let a winery to younger generation to start their own thing, you know. Oh, absolutely. Well, let's talk about your wines. Um, so you definitely a West Side winery. Right now, are you using long-term contracts? Let's talk about your vineyards and kind of how your wine blends are. Yeah, so we uh we use about 10 to 12 different producers, uh, even a little bit more with Solen all together. Um, so my brother uh, Angel the whole farming process and and um and winemaking. And when I say farming is we don't actually farm physically and go every day to those vineyards because it's not ours. Mm-hmm. But we have contract with those farmers. My brother kind of follow them and kind of tell them what we like to have at the end and how we like the vines to be treated in order in order to get the quality that we want uh, for the grapes. So you really follow them on a monthly and daily basis when we are close to a harvest to um, to get the best grade. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, all of them are mainly on the west side. Uh, we like the west side because it's a little bit cooler. Uh, you know, you have more rolling hills, limestone, and all of that. So you have a great terroir on the west side. And it fits really well our brand because, you know, Binom, it's all about... Um, more like a French time uh, of wine. And so wines are a little bit softer, um, a little bit less concentrated and extracted. We want more freshness on our wine. So my brother makes sure we pick that at the right time to really capture more freshness. Um, but we really uh, focus on, on, on this side of wine, I would say. And on the top of that, you know, coming from France, where there is so much regulations, yeah. uh, we wanted to kind of break the rules a little bit um, and be more, you know, a French style winery with a new world type of blend. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we focus on Cabernet at 50, 60 percent, which is very unusual from West Side wineries. West Side wineries are more Rhone driven. Um, so we focus on Cab and then we play with Rhone and Spanish vitals to to create those unique cubes. And so. That's very important for us to be able to showcase our creativity and the freedom in Paso that we were not allowed to do back in France, you know. So we have wines like Les Deux Frères, which is a Grenache Cabernet Tempranillo. We have one Muse, it's a Mourvet Cabernet. So we really play on those vitals mm-hmm. uh, to find thickness, balance, freshness, and structure. But so the one thing I want to talk about, so Bordeaux, so you specialize in Bordeaux varietals with like almost like a Rhone nuance to it. And that kind of matches what is really happening on the West side. And I think few people realize that how much Cabernet is actually planted on the West side. Mm-hmm. There's, it's a, it's a major force. And I think it's just from the hillsides. Yeah. I mean, if you talk about Joe Paso, generally speaking, with the whole appellation East side and West side, the first grape uh, to be planted is Cabernet. Uh, I don't know what's the percentage on the west side. I would say it's more road driven on the west side. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but what you see for the caliber of wineries like us, those wineries are more driven by Rhone than they are with Bordeaux. And so that was important for us to do different things as well uh, because there's so many great GSMs, Syrahs, Grenaches, and all of that on the west side of Paso and east side of Paso that we wanted to showcase different things. And so we have, you know, uh, not a lot of people are doing Cab, Cab mm-hmm. Cab Morvet, Carignan as well. We use Graciano, we use Tempranillo. So we are going a little bit to Spain uh, because, you know, it's it's hot here. And so Spanish grapes really strive. Yeah, no, I think Tempranillo would be, I, 
Tempranillo, Grenache, and Cab sounds like a fantastic blend. Um, let's talk about like so. Let's let's talk about for a second about your um, marketing your wines and distinguishing it. It's a it's all one big good collaborative happy family. But at the end of the day, you got to separate yourself out from the next winery down the road. How do you set Binom apart? You know, it's um, it's not like um, I would say a marketing plan on how to differentiate ourselves. It's not being yourself. You know, mm-hmm. uh, the first goal is to make the best wine that we can. The second goal is to give one of the best experience, and the third goal is to have a uh, um, branding. Uh, when I talk about branding, it's website. Uh, social media, labels, collaterals that match all the work that we do on the farming and the winemaking side because we are very into the details. And so, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we are very picky with my brother. And so we always look at all the details, the big picture, but as well the details. And so we want this to match, you know, all the work that people don't see. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's 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 what I think is we are doing with our marketing is just uh, is just matching what we do on the back, and then after how uh, you know we get people in is more like word to mouth. You know, main members that comes in, they join the club and they text their uh, brother or friend and like, oh, you got to go to Binum, and then they come in. And then we have our peers. I mean, our peers, it's a lot of our traffic too that recommend us, you know, when somebody likes Cabernet Sauvignon or likes softer reds, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's every, everything is more like by where to mouth. You mm-hmm. know, we're taking a lot of events. We're going to do a little bit more because we have more wine now, but it's more like a, a very organic, you know, mm-hmm. thing. In that attention to detail, I, I can testify to that because having <laughs> we are the ones that built your website, and it has got to be one of the more unique um, on-brand websites, not to toot our own horn, that uh, we've done. And I yeah. it's such a pleasure to do because a lot of times you get a winery that, um, and I, I even have a blog article on 10 reasons yeah. why wineries seem to want a crappy website. <laughs> yeah. It just, sometimes it's just like our wine speaks for itself, just throw it up there on a site and it's good enough. But with you, it there's this unified experience where you go through the site and you can tell that time was taken. It wasn't just put up a template. Yeah, I I think what's the big force of Binom is the fact that you know Guillaume, my brother, doesn't really need to think about the the, the, the whole marketing sales side, mm-hmm. and I don't need to think about the whole production and farming side. And so we are really focused into our role into that brand. And that's what created that big synergy uh, with the two of us and really focus into our details uh, on every aspect of running a winery. When you talk about those producers that have a crappy site, you know, some most of the time it's it's the guy that started his brand, he's really passionate about making wine, but he doesn't have the sales and marketing plan yet mm-hmm. to develop the brand. And as his team grow. You hire the right people to make the site look good. Mm, sure. sure. No, it's, like it's so that. important. What, talk, what, I want to talk, shift to, shift to a, a different topic that's really want to get your thoughts on this. So pricing has just gone off the roof with supplies and just everything in the supply chain is going up. And at the end of the road, the only how do you deal with all raising prices or increasing prices on the supply side when the wine, it, when really one of your only rudders is to increase the price of your wine, but sometimes you just can't. So how are, how are you confronting that? As I didn't phrase that very well. You always, uh, not anticipate, but you always, you know, when you start to want to have a, a cushion of security, which uh, is what we did uh, for Binum. Uh, and, and so we were able to eat the cost, uh, I would say easily in some ways, but or you see, we ha- everybody has to raise prices. Mm-hmm. You cannot keep eating, eating, eating. It's not a good business decision. So we try to be very fair, uh, you know, on 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 that, and we do raise our pricing, uh, but not crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and and we look to obviously uh, the quality of the, the our peers, the quality of others, and that's kind of how we we built our pricing. But it's more like uh, again, you know, pricing is very subjective. You know, mm-hmm. and you can uh, people will say it's not worth it, or people will say, yeah, it's it's a great deal. And so it's very subjective approach. And so we um you know we we just want to have a product. Uh, that reflects again all the work we do behind, uh, and I uh, I wish I can show all the people that come at the winery all the stuff that we look, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, from the vineyard perspective, the winery perspective, you know, the selection that we do in a vineyard, the selection that we do on our blending. Uh, sometimes we can lose, you know, from picking the grapes to bottling the wine, we can lose 20, 25 percent of what we paid. And that we, we we sell on the bird market, you know. So it's a hard selection of the best of the best. And so mm-hmm. obviously it takes time uh, and uh, financial to arrive to that point. And so we think, you know, our, our wines are fairly priced. Mm-hmm. No, I think they're very fairly priced too. But when a whole supply side goes up 30, 40%, because suddenly that's what the suppliers are able, and not just yeah. the grape <laughs> contracts, but everything. From glycol to barrels to bottles, oh. to everything. It that all has to filter down hundred, some way. Hundred liters, I think it's hundred liters uh, barrel of uh, glycol was five, five, six years ago, two hundred or four hundred dollars a barrel, and now it's two thousand dollars. We installed the whole glycol system when it was at two thousand dollars a barrel, and not four hundred, unfortunately. And so those costs, you, you, you just don't understand how how can they go so fast, you know? Uh, and you, t- you you are not talking about thirty percent over. It's yeah. much more. So we try to to play with it as much as we can. You know, we we do com- you know compare pricing from you know suppliers to another. We try to to play with it. You know, sometimes we delay stuff because it's just too expensive. So. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that today we are not building the winery. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. who knows? Maybe in six years it would be much more expensive. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, Let's uh, as we're kind of wrapping up. Definitely want to hear about your events because you've got some pretty amazing events. And the one of the parts that stands out is some of the um, food pairings that you've got. Yeah. So you know we uh, we really again focus on. Experience, uh, yeah. education. Uh, education, it's a big part of you. See, we don't want to educate 100% during a tasting or an event because it would be overwhelming. But we always want to have that part of education. Uh, and so those events are uh, in the spring, we do a more seminar style where people sit down and have, you know, four wines or six wines, and each of them is paired with food. And so we work with a uh, most of the time, local chef to create a pairing around each wine. So it's always changing. Obviously, we have some chef that comes back and some chef that gonna come back later. But um, we really focus on the pairing and telling uh, a part of uh, food pairing education to our member. But again, it's very subjective. Uh, and so in the fall, we do a much more laid back where. We still are the pairing side, but it's not. It's more like a fun, but f- fun event, social event. Everybody stand up. We have a music group, and we enjoy just talking to each other. So, so fun, fun. It really helps that whole hospitality side. Yeah. Um, so that's part of the kind of the pick up uh, educational events, and then we have dinners uh, that we do for our members. Um, we do two dinners uh, for Binum. One in the spring, one in the fall. Um, like this year, the spring, we did a co-dinner with my brother, Akris Solen, who stayed at their winery. And we um, we uh, we paired Bino wines and Akris wines around a nice dinner with both membership uh, customers. Uh, and then in the fall, it's always our winemaker dinner, uh, mm. where this year we're going to be at Oak and Vine and pull some library, future releases and um, have a good time that's what matters 
Yeah, that sounds that sounds fantastic. So speaking of good time and drinking wine, when you're not drinking Bino and Clos Celine or anything in your French family, what do you like to drink? I drink a lot of French wine. I drink. <laughs> What's your favorite region? Uh, I would say if I have to pick on the red side, I will go to a Cote Roti, mm. uh, so northern France, Jurabis. Uh After on the white side, obviously. White Burgundy, uh, you mm. cannot you cannot go better than that. Uh, White Burgundy are for me the best wine uh, in the world, uh, and as well, if it's bubbles, uh, it has to be champagne. Yeah, uh, but no, it's 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 good, you know, to um, to continue to uh, you know, we have our tasting with a team. We try to do it every week, but it's not easy every week. Uh, but we try to go to Europe. We try to go to New world area to have them discover what is you know Grenache uh, in in Chateau Neuf du Pape versus here and sometimes you find a lot of similarities and so that's very important for them to know that and taste what is like on those other appellations in order again to educate more and more our customers. Mm-hmm. Education it's a big part for us, a big part. Absolutely. So as, as we're wrapping down, is there anything we haven't talked about that you want to bring up? Any shout outs or? Uh, no, we talk about France. We talk about our brand. I don't know. Did, I, did we forget anything? Bianca, did you? No, you're a busy guy. The only thing I could, I my only question is how you manage it all, Arno. You've got Benom, you've got Procure, you've got your friend, you've got a lot going on. Yeah, no, pro- Procure is definitely by the what we just talked about, the continuation of accessing, uh, you know, those French wine. And, um, you know, um, I used to work for a wine merchant in Bordeaux. And um, I was like, those contacts that I made in, over there are gold. And so uh, I started using them by creating Procure with a, a friend, my, I mean, my old boss from law. Mm-hmm. And uh, the goal was to get access to uh, those wines easily. And the best way to do so is to, I would say, do it yourself. This way they show up to your door. And so that's where, you know, I started uh, uh, kind of developing it. And yes, it's a lot of time, um, but it's a good completion. Uh, it really complements Venom. Um, and now with the kids, one is two, the other one is five. It's definitely you are you are busy, and my wife being a full time at adventure, we are busy, but we like being busy. Uh, trust me, it's not easy every day, uh, you know. But I would say it's for everyone like that. Uh, but we have more joy than than uh, sadness, so that's what matters. That makes that it. makes it easier to keep going. <laughs> yeah, good, good way to finish. Yeah. Well, Arnaud, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, guys. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. You have a great day, and we will talk to you later. Sounds good. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. We'll see you again next time, and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.